Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's twice weekly podcast on leadership with Scott Miller. That's me, I'm your host and interviewer each week in our sixth year, 350 plus episodes where every week we shine the megawatt spotlight that is Franklin Covey, the world's most trusted leadership company, of course, co-founded by the iconic author and thought leader Stephen R. Covey. You know him as the leader of our firm initially and the author of the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Each week we try to bring to you valuable and practical conversations around being a better leader. Some weeks we focus on marketing, operations, culture, someone's life journey, a researcher or scientist that may have toiled in obscurity and found something valuable for, to make you a better leader. Perhaps you are an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, solopreneur. Maybe you are in the C-suite of a global company or you are at your home leading your family full-time. We hope this podcast resonates with you. Our guest today is the iconic and prestigious author, advisor, Raj Shah, he currently serves as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, not too chabby, chabby. He is the author of the new release, Big Bets. What a great cover, huh? How large-scale change really happens. Hold on to this because beyond his remarkable academic credentials as a doctor, he's had a remarkable career of public service in the not-for-profit philanthropic foundation world, working in the White House and helping America spread, hopefully, healthy democracy around the world. Raj, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be with you. Raj, I'd like to start and ask you to seriously check your humility, because you have a remarkable career. Would you take a few minutes, literally, walk us through your academic journey, talk about some of the highlights and roles you played with the Gates Foundation, in the Obama administration, what you're doing now at the Rockefeller Foundation, and then we'll get into some of the key learnings on your book, Big Bets. Well, that's that's great, and I'm happy to. You know, I, I uh, come from a very uh, common place, I think. I'm, I'm the child, child of two immigrant parents. My parents came here in the late 60s and early 70s from India without any resources, but with an unbelievable faith in America. And like so many immigrants that came in that wave, uh, they felt if they could study, get degrees, and work hard, their kids would have great opportunities. I grew up in suburban Detroit, dreamed of uh, being in the auto industry because that my dad was at Ford and I loved cars and I just sort of was a car geek that way. Uh, and I ended up uh, falling in love with, with both medicine and public service. Medicine probably because uh, in my Indian American immigrant community, you were either going to be an engineer or a doctor. And when I decided it wasn't going to be engineering, it became medicine. Uh, and public service because, you know, in so many experiences, I was struck by just the inequities that we see every day in the modern world. And I was inspired actually by a unique visit that Nelson Mandela made to Detroit. Uh, an incredible moment in my childhood. I didn't get to meet him or anything, but just watched it on television and was taken by his message of love and hope. And I thought, gosh, I'm not going to be a Nelson Mandela by any stretch, but I'd like to make a positive difference in the world. And that sort of started a journey uh, into an academic career and then over to the Gates Foundation in a political campaign on Al Gore's uh, presidential campaign in Nashville, Tennessee, and ultimately to the uh, Obama administration and beyond. So you truncated that a little bit. I would like for you to revisit a bit and just remind people the rigorous academic credentials you earned. And then would you talk a little bit more specifically about what are some of the roles you served in the Gates Foundation early on? Because they certainly have been instructive to the things you've done with USAID and uh, now also at the Rockefeller Foundation. I'm going to ask, I'm going I'm to invite you to revisit that, check more humility, because I think it's an important part of your journey for our listeners to learn, and it, I think it also bolsters your credibility. Sure. Well, you know, I went to the University of Michigan and, and studied economics. Um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania for medical school and the Wharton School of Business for a master's degree in uh, econometrics and health economics. And I was always intellectually interested in uh, public policy and in, in how, uh, how large scale change happened in trying to make an impact at scale. And I thought understanding policy and economics along with my scientific discipline of medicine would allow me to help uh, work on health issues, both at home here in the United States uh, and around the world. And I, when I was a young kid, I would travel to India and see kids growing up 
uh, in slums and other types of living conditions and just couldn't believe the huge human inequities uh, that you can so viscerally feel and wanted to do something about it. So that's kind of my academic journey. One seminal moment for me was uh, when my now wife, then girlfriend helped me uh, develop the courage to actually leave medicine to work on a, on a presidential campaign. So after taking my board exams at, at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, I got in the car the next day, drove 14 hours with her to Nashville, Tennessee, spent the next three to four months living in Al Gore's best friend's pool house uh, and trying to figure out how to be involved in presidential politics. We lost that campaign. I was unemployed, uh, very confused, thought I had thrown my career away because I didn't really feel I could go back to medicine and the practice of it. And one thing led to another, and I ended up interviewing at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation right in those early days when Bill and Melinda had you know, tremendously ambitious goals for how they might be able to use their extraordinary wealth to transform the face of human inequity around the planet. And I was honored to be a part of that team. And, and that's sort of where the journey I describe in the book starts. What exact point on that did your parents both disown you and then reclaim you back into the family? Because I'm sure that happened at some point. <laughs> oh, I, uh, two very specific moments. One was when I, when I said that I was really giving up. I had a full scholarship, something called a medical scientist training program grant to get an MD, PhD at Penn. Uh, when I called my parents to say that I was giving that up to go volunteer on a presidential campaign, unpaid, uh, 14 hours away, uh, doing work, I didn't even know what I would do when I, when I sort of uh, finally first got the offer to be a volunteer there. Uh, that, that was a tough conversation. And, you know, it's not that they were angry as much as they were just super scared and nervous. Uh, and then I remember uh, when they got less nervous about the whole thing was at the end of my six and a half years serving in the Obama administration, President Obama had the family come in to say goodbye and, and meet in the Oval Office. And my dad and mom were able to join my three kids and, and my wife, Shivam. Uh, my dad walked in and, and said to the president, he said, Mr. President, you know, you don't get enough credit for saving the American auto industry. To which, uh, and remember, he worked at Ford for 30 plus years. So, so the president says to him, oh, really? Come sit down and tell me more. And they had like a 20 minute conversation. And, uh, and walking out of there, I said, Dad, what do you think? Is it OK that I don't practice medicine? And he's like, yeah, I guess it's OK. <laughs> so that's that's, that's sort it's of a very that. tender story. Uh, I want to organize today's interview against the backdrop of one of the most devastating humanitarian catastrophes in our lifetime, and that was the consequential earthquake that happened in Haiti that, if I'm not mistaken, I think it took the lives of you know, nearly a quarter of a million people, and, and more than that were displaced or wounded or lives changed forever. I mean, Haiti can't catch a break. Uh, you led the efforts for the U.S. government amongst a team of very competent colleagues um, as the leader of the of USAID. Would you take a few moments and talk about the conversation that happened in the White House, in the Oval Office, with then President uh, Barack Obama and then Vice President Joseph Biden? What, that's an inter interesting moment. And then talk about some of the big points around the Haitian catastrophe. And I'm going to ask you some pointed questions, lessons from your book that every leader can apply in their life right now. Uh, well, that, well, that's great. And, and let me maybe start with a little context. Uh, the, the U.S. Agency for International Development has about 11,000 people, and now about a $30 billion annual budget. And its primary task is to invest in communities around the world that are vulnerable, that are poor, that have high risks of infectious disease and political instability, to try to give people hope and opportunity. And as the lead humanitarian entity, on behalf of America's engagements around the world. Uh, when the Haiti earthquake in January of 2010 took place, uh, I, I was appointed to lead the response uh, to that earthquake by President Obama. The difference was uh, when the president called me about an hour and a half after the earthquake hit, uh, he wanted a whole of government response, which meant he wanted to deploy the US military and all of its assets, use the Coast Guard, use as much collaborative effort as we could across every asset of government. And in that context, it was relatively unique to select that my title was USAID administrator for that particular role, uh, but he did. And 
and, and the other piece of context was uh, I had just started in that job. I was about, I, I was in my first week on the job. I'd just been sworn in. Uh, most of my colleagues uh, that were political appointees had not yet been sworn in, so there were a lot of vacancies in our organization when we were charged with this effort. Uh, and I was 36, so I was fairly, fairly young by historical standards for, for that particular role. So the next morning when we went in to brief uh, the president and the vice president, the whole uh, you know, half of the cabinet that was involved in the response, I, I hustled, I got prepared, I hustled over. I'd actually been all night in the office uh, working on structuring the response and figuring out what was going on in this fog of a catastrophe. And, uh, and it was a tremendous catastrophe. I mean, I mean now we know 250,000 people perished, 21 out of 22 government ministries physically collapsed. The United Nations, which usually leads both the security forces and humanitarian efforts on the ground, their building collapsed and they lost more than 100 members of, of the UN services teams and their security forces. So it was, it was an unmitigated disaster and, and it was happening two hours from our shores. And so uh, when I walked in to the Oval Office, I got there a few minutes early because uh, I certainly didn't want to be late. And the president and the vice president were over by the window uh, on the side of the desk talking to each other. And uh, Obama was facing kind of the, the entrance uh, so he could see me walk in and Biden was facing the window. So he was, he was, his back was to me. And as I walked in, I overheard uh, Vice President Biden telling President Obama, are you sure about putting this Raj Shah guy in charge? You know, he's 36 something and he just got to Washington. Uh, and we have other folks who have more experience, uh, notably a gentleman who, who named Craig Fugate, who led the Federal Emergency Management Association uh, agency. And he said we could put, you know, that would be an alternative. And before Obama could answer, I heard the, the statement, uh, Obama saw me walk in, so he came over and was like, Raj, come in, sit down. Uh, but I was, you know, I was a little anxious in that moment. I mean, the, the book shares so many stories across your work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, including a meeting once, I think it was in New York at the Waldorf or somewhere, where it was your first meeting with Bill Gates uh, after having worked in the, in the foundation for several years. And you went up to his suite and he pulled out one of your memos. And I think his first words are like, this is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. And so you have a lot of training around how Bill Gates thought and his use of data, his provocative question asking. Your book is in essence kind of an ode to the value of asking smart questions, being patient, working collaborative, collaboratively with perhaps you know unsuspecting allies and the use of data. What I'd like to do is pitch a couple of principles from this book, Raj, and have you maybe teach them to us either from or through the lens of your work with your colleagues in the Haitian catastrophe or perhaps other situations. One of your inspiring thoughts is be an optimist. Don't get consumed by today's cynicism. We're taping this interview in January 2024. My sense is it'll release probably in early February or such coming into the Iowa caucuses where cynicism is gonna be rife in American politics around the world. Remind us, teach us how we can be an optimist when it's so easy to be consumed in today's cynicism, especially as as leaders we're trying to take on big audacious goals in projects, either our communities, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, our companies, you name it. Well, you know, it's pre precisely at times of crises and confusion that we sometimes come together to do our, our most meaningful work. And at the end of the day, I am an optimist, and I think it's essential that leaders uh, are optimistic, particularly on the kinds of issues I worked on. Haiti's a great example. I mean, in that moment, we weren't sure if we could land C-130 aircraft and, and bring urban search and rescue teams in to remove people who were trapped under, you know, thousands of uh, buildings that had collapsed in the rubble. And you don't know, you know, can you do it, can't you do it? If you're not the optimist that says, sits there with the US military and says, what do we have to do to try to get these planes on the ground to try to get, in that case, a few hundred urban search and rescue professionals from across our country into Port-au-Prince and actively saving lives in a narrow 24 to 48 hour windows when they can still save those lives. You just don't uh, impart a sense of can-do spirit across a distributed team of thousands of people trying to do the right thing in a moment of real moral need. So I believe a lot of the stories I tell in the book, whether it's responding to the Haiti earthquake, beating back the Ebola crisis in West Africa before it spread, 
beyond that region and became a global pandemic, addressing hunger and uh, food insecurity after the 2008 food, fuel, and financial crisis moved 100 million people back into hunger and caused more than 40 episodes of political instability around the world. Uh, you can only take these things on if you're an optimist that these problems can be solved. And I wrote the book, Big Bets, so that more people, young people, but also seasoned executives can uh, be reminded that it is in fact that optimism that makes the world go around. And, and that is as true if you're working on humanitarian catastrophes as it is if you're building you know, a financial services firm. Raj, I want to ask you a question through the lens of having been a long-serving director, administrator of the USAID. Did you say their budget was $40 billion? Uh, yeah, roughly 30, but yeah, yes. 30, 30 billion, yeah, give or take a 10. $30 billion, and I think you said about 11,000 employees? Correct, across so, maybe 70 countries around the world. So I do not mean this to be a political question. No doubt you have a political pejorative based on some of the administrations that you either volunteered in or served in. Will you remind our listeners and viewers why you think it's important that the U.S. taxpayers support $30 billion of philanthropic investment in foreign countries and what the purpose of that is and why you think that ultimately benefits Americans? Well, first I would just say it's national security, not philanthropy. Yeah. Uh, we know and history has proven time and time again that if we work to prevent pandemics before they spread around the world and become devastating and crushing to our economies like the one we just lived through in COVID-19, or if we work to address the root causes of hunger, malnutrition, and deep suffering before they cause political instability and violence that then requires a military response, or if we invest in putting election observers on the ground and putting proper democratic processes in place in country after country, we can prevent violence, we can prevent war, and we can breed stability in the first place. And perhaps the most stark example of that is the difference between the North and South Korea on the Korean Peninsula. USAID's early investments in South Korea helped create a democratic environment where an economy could grow. And today there are more jobs in the United States from our trade relationship with South Korea than there are with France. And the opposite is also true. When we are isolated from and neglect a nation like North Korea, and they go back to the other side, they create long-term and persistent security threats that threatens every American. Uh, and so for, you know, for less than 1% of the federal budget, uh, this investment in our national security, our long-term national security, is actually one of the most efficient things we can do. And it's why Republican and Democratic presidents and administrations and Congresses have supported America's lead humanitarian role around the world. Raj, another concept in your book is this idea of find fresh, innovative solutions, even ones that are risky. Would you draw upon your multi-decade career and maybe, maybe illuminate one particular solution that was risky, that maybe did or didn't pay off, but just proves the point that CEOs and, 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 and uh, principals and superintendents and college presidents and mayors and others that are leading organizations may need to check their own ego, their own fields of experience, their own uh, brands, and search for better innovative solutions from other people that they themselves might think are risky but need to be tested and implemented to move society, their customer base, their profitability, their constituent service forward. Well, you know, perhaps I'll start with where a, a reference you made. You talked about a memo I wrote for Bill Gates and his initial reaction to that memo. That came out of, of two or three years of working together where Bill and Melinda Gates had said, look, uh, we, we know there are hundreds of thousands of children every year that die of simple vaccine preventable diseases. They had read an article uh, about a, a disease called rotavirus. And they learned in that same article that, that Merck was going to roll out a rotavirus vaccine in the United States, but the deaths from rotavirus were not happening in the United States. They were happening in India and Latin America and primarily in parts of Africa. And those places would not get access to the vaccine. And they just said, look, this is wrong. Can we make sure that every child born on Earth gets every vaccine that could save their life? And, uh, and we worked on that, and we figured out what the gaps were, how much that would cost. It would cost way more than what we had as our own resources. And more than that, we realized there wasn't even an industrial supply base for a global immunization effort at that scale. 
And so the memo I constructed was actually a team project that had taken a year to put together, and it was a proposed uh, social impact bond, the world's first big social impact bond that would be backed by governments to help the vaccine industry and UNICEF work together to develop a vaccine industrial supply base to, to basically double vaccination coverage across our planet and save millions of lives. And the, the proposal rested on a, a fundamental idea that the Gates Foundation at the time would backstop the issuance of this bond by guaranteeing it. And that was a tremendous risk. It was putting billions of dollars of potential foundation assets at some risk. And even though we knew that, well, it probably won't be needed, uh, probably is not certainty. <laughs> and so, so I took that risk. I kind of extended beyond my skis, as I think how most listeners might uh, interpret it. And uh, the fact that we jumped first and the fact that we made that commitment gave others the confidence to join. And those others included France, the UK, the Netherlands, Norway, Italy, country after country. And by the time Germany joined, for example, the bond deal was so solid, our guarantee wasn't even needed. The results were we raised five or so billion dollars in the first big social impact bond, created a global supply base for childhood vaccination. And 20 years later, 980 million kids have been vaccinated and 16 million child lives have been saved. And these numbers sometimes obscure the true human impact, having, having spent time holding kids uh, that have perished from diseases that are easily preventable, I can tell you that is such a tragic um, and god-awful moment anywhere in the world. Uh, and every parent listening can understand how serious that is. Being able to save 16 million kids makes our world more safe and secure and frankly makes our world more just. So sometimes you gotta take risks to achieve big goals. And uh, sometimes the ideas don't look like they're right right away and you have to work on them to mitigate the risks. But uh, I wrote this book largely because I believe there's so much more space for taking smart risks in trying to make the world a better place. Raj, a little bit of a curveball here. You are not a geopolitical strategist. You are by academic training a physician. You are by academic training an econometric expert, you like data, you're a bit of a data nerd as self-disclosed. You've spent your entire career trying to think about and help solve global problems by marshalling both public and private sector funds towards that and inspire people. I'm interested in your worldview. Um, how do you think the world works that most common people like me that are passionate and raised in families with perhaps one or another political view how does the world work that you think most people don't understand? Well, I, you know, especially as it relates to our politics, because I did serve in administration and I've worked to help pass bipartisan legislation on multiple occasions, and I write about it in the book. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing that I had to learn that I didn't understand until I got into politics at a fairly high level and learned it uh, was that, you know, everybody's a person and and everybody uh, needs relationships needs friendship needs uh, collaboration wants to be heard has values that developed over the course of their life that brought them to where they are and even if you have strong disagreements with in this case i served in a democratic administration at a time of extreme and increasing polarization uh, even then, I was able to learn how to build authentic, true, personal relationships with people that were on the far other end of the political spectrum. And we were able to travel together, we were able to pray together, we were able to talk about our kids and why we got into public service together. And we were able to kind of realize that, well, we all have these roles for a small window of time, and can we collaborate to actually create positive change in the world. And for me, it was a lesson that I had to let go of a lot of practices. I had to give up my sort of insistence on just being a data nerd all the time and proving I was right, uh, which was a tactic that worked for me in terms of getting to the job I was in. This is at USAID. But it was not going to work to pass major legislation to help America lead efforts to fight hunger and poverty around the world. That would require listening, that would require prayer, that would require understanding different faith traditions. It would require knowing 
how people develop their values and, and then finding ways to collaborate within that. So I think make it personal, which is the lesson uh, of, the, of the book chapter on this particular topic, is the, is the biggest single lesson I've learned. Uh, there's just no substitute for those deep, personal, authentic relationships. Beautifully said, that takes patience, that takes curiosity, that takes empathy, that takes self-awareness, that requires you to recognize that you don't have a complete picture of everything, you don't have all the facts, other people have legitimate paths to their own political opinions and worldviews as well. It does require a, a level of maturity that I think a lot of us need to, me first, exercise, especially on a topic where you have entrenched beliefs and mindsets and you've curated data and facts to support that and think the other person hasn't done that same level of work. Um, Scott, can I add one, one thought to that, which is I also think it takes being willing to be vulnerable with others. Hmm. I think so, so much of modern society and our impression of leaders is people who are infallible. You know, they're, they're strong, they're correct, they're smart, they're um, charging up a mountain uh, fearlessly. That's our image of leaders. Uh, and, and yet I've found that to make some of the biggest things we've done happen, beating back an Ebola crisis in West Africa, moving 100 million people out of hunger and poverty through investments in agriculture, uh, creating global frameworks for fighting pandemics. A lot of the relationship development that makes that happen and the alliances and the strange bedfellows, they only happen when you sit down and, and you say, hey guys, I'm, I'm stuck, I need help, I'm nervous about something, I have this vulnerability. And I, I think leaders do better if they can figure out how to be authentic and vulnerable uh, in those discussions in a way that's appropriate. Raj, let's belabor this for a moment because this really is at the heart of what Franklin Covey is so passionate about is, you know, we believe that the best leaders, the best individual contributors, the best, most highly effective people are those that have the skills to develop deep, mutually beneficial, high-trusting relationships. We hear this ad nauseum. The fact of the matter is, all of us can improve on our ability to develop relationships. You know, some of us are introverts. Some of, this are, of us are extroverts. Neither of those are a perfect formula for always developing relationships. Some of us think before we speak. Some of us think while we speak. Some of us speak and then think, right? You mentioned the book, the process of a lot of leaders have the proclivity to follow the fire aim ready or fire ready aim. And so I think it's important that we just take a moment and remind all of our listeners and viewers that all of us are on a level, a process of maturing to be better at developing relationships. Can you maybe share an example of someone where you were on a opposite political view, you had an opinion about their credibility, their character, their motive, where you maybe moved outside your comfort zone, you developed some vulnerability with an uncanny character and you developed a relationship that got something done that otherwise couldn't have happened without that effort. Sure, you know, when I was leading USAID, actually uh, we, we being the Democratic Party, lost the Congress in 2010 and in, during the midterm elections. And so the first budget proposed in the 2011 budget would have canceled out much of USAID's programs in particular. And in an effort to defend our agency's budget, and because of my training as effectively a data scientist, you know, I had done and had my teams do extraordinary analysis to show the impacts of these budget cuts. And I, I went in front of Congress and I testified. And the headline coming out of that testimony was, was Raj Shah says Republican budget will kill 70,000 kids. And I detailed where those 70,000 deaths might come from, reductions in malaria programs, cutting off HIV uh, treatments for pregnant women. Uh, there's a whole uh, very technically sophisticated uh, modeling that showed that that could be a likely outcome. And I got back to my office and I started getting congratulatory phone calls from folks saying, hey, uh, you really told them good job and thanks for being tough. And I didn't intend to be tough, I just wanted to be data oriented. Uh, and then I got a call from a good friend, Tom Vilsack, and he had been with uh, Speaker Boehner uh, who was the Speaker of the House, and, and he said, Raj, you know, the Speaker's quite upset with you. Like, the, he has worked very hard 
to build a quiet, conservative Republican movement to support humanitarian work around the world. And he felt your statements were insensitive. So I went to see him. I apologized. He gave me a list of uh, 30, 40 members and senators to get to know. Uh, and he said, look, and, and when, we, when I went on that mission, I determined, I said, look, I'm not going to go and just try to sell the need for our budget. I was going to go and, and, and really listen and learn and get to know folks based on their values. And one senator I got to know very well, Senator Jim Inhofe, conservative senator from Oklahoma, uh, became a very, very good friend. And I learned that he, uh, he adopted a child from Ethiopia. He cared deeply about the issues I cared about. Uh, he, he did not believe in climate change and, and didn't you know, buy into the language that some of our programs were described in. Uh, but he absolutely understood. And when we traveled together to Africa, he would talk to farmers and say, hey, if it's hotter and drier here, what's happening to your kids? And they would say, our kids are going hungry. Can you help? And he helped us help. Together, we worked to pass the Global Food Security Act, the, one of the largest pieces of bipartisan global legislation in Congress. It's been reauthorized twice since then, and it has both moved 100 million people out of hunger and poverty it has prevented countless episodes of political instability. And it was the basis uh, just a year and a half ago of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, an effort to get grain out of Ukraine into Africa and elsewhere to avert further humanitarian catastrophes. And it has twice been reauthorized on a bipartisan basis. So I think you know those kinds of experiences have taught me that slowing down, being a little less smart, and being a much better listener to really get to know people's values and their authentic uh, rationale for their thinking is is very, very useful skill for leaders as they develop. Of the many wise things that our co-founder, Dr. Stephen Covey, said amongst them was, with people, fast is slow, and slow is fast. Two more concepts, and I'll let you go, Raj. Uh, from this book, Big Bets, you say, recruit and retain committed partners however unlikely they may be. You gave a good example of that with um, uh, uh, Speaker of the House Boehner. Is there another example that might be a little more relevant to the private sector even, about what you mean when you say recruit and retain committed partners, however unlikely they may be? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of uh, solving a lot of the problems I've worked on with others, hunger, health, uh, pandemics, require deep partnerships with private sector companies, innovators, and operators. And so, you know, I spend a lot of my time uh, as the leader of some of these efforts now building those collaborations and those relationships. So I'll give you one example. We have an effort underway. Our biggest bet at the Rockefeller Foundation is to reach a billion people who live in energy poverty. They don't have enough electricity to power one light bulb and one small appliance in their home over the course of a year, and as a result are trapped in subsistence poverty. Uh, we, we think we can bring renewable energy solutions, solar systems, grid, small grid systems, technology-enabled metering systems, to them and to help them move out of poverty. And we have pioneered these solutions in many parts of the world over the last decade and brought the price down to an affordable price point for them where they're eager to consume that electricity and use it to lift themselves up. Our main partner in making that happen became Tata Power, a very large power company in India. And uh, it, that collaboration is now building 10,000 of these small rural mini grids it will reach 25 million people who live in poverty and help move them out of poverty. And we're doing that on a commercial basis. And for us to build the kind of partnership with a, with a large conglomerate company like that, uh, based on ideas that were founded by you know, deep NGOs and in, in rural communities that have worked with poor, uh, poor families for a very long time, requires building a lot of trust. There's, there's a natural tendency for the big corporate partners to look at the small local NGOs and say, that's good charitable work, but it's never going to be a viable business. Uh, and you don't even understand what it takes to build a scalable business. And there's a lot of a tendency in those small local NGOs, who, by the way, are people who live with impoverished communities and suffer alongside because they care so much to say, oh, those folks just want to make money and build coal plants and we can't trust them. And so the work we do to build trust across that divide helped launch 
this big project in India and, and now globally. And I could tell that story over and over again. We did that with uh, diagnostic testing companies in America on the, uh, the outset of the COVID pandemic to help create the antigen testing that we all use, the rapid tests that are on uh, pharmacy store shelves even today. We did that with uh, big companies like Cargill that ultimately helped us fight famines in places like Somalia and save tens of thousands of lives as a result of their efforts. But those collaborations only work when, when you build trust across a divide. And to build trust across a divide, especially public-private, uh, you just have to cast some uh, skepticism and some assumptions aside and go out there and make new friends. Raj, send us off with your passion. One of your concepts from the book Big Bets is you say, fiercely measure results, learn, and persist. Uh, when is it right to bet? Is there, is there an occasion when the data says one thing and your gut and your instinct say something else? Or you choose, you have a formula, you have a process of how to merge those together. You obviously are a self-admitted data wonk. It's been the core of your career, your credibility, your influence. How, how, would, you, how would you advise leaders to balance their instincts with what the data say? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'll give you maybe two, two quick examples that, that are both instructive because they are on different ends of the data availability spectrum. The first was when, when the Ebola crisis in West Africa, this is a hemorrhagic fever uh, that was killing seven out of every 10 people who contracted it. It was exploding as a disease in the summer of 2014 in Liberia and had literally led to the deaths of about 50% of the Liberian health workforce. Uh, and the CDC, the American CDC, did a study that showed we could have 1.6 million cases of Ebola, including tens or hundreds of thousands in the United States. Uh, and that was terrifying. And in that context, President Obama made a big bet and, and for the first time in American history deployed U.S. troops, 3,000 of them, to West Africa to help contain the pandemic there and beat it back there before it could spread. When we made that decision, we didn't know exactly which strategies technically would be effective at getting the transmission rate down to, to zero. Uh, but we knew that if we built a data architecture and if we experimented with different types of interventions, we could measure which ones worked and which ones didn't. We ultimately learned that most of the transmission happened when, when often young girls would wash and redress the bodies of the deceased and they were contracting Ebola then. So the local communities designed these burial teams that would go in fully clad in protective equipment and take the bodies out in a respectful, culturally appropriate way. And we saw that that was leading to a 70% reduction in transmission. And we scaled that up quickly. And Ebola ended with 30,000 cases, not 1.6 million, 11,000 deaths, and only two cases in the United States with no transmission on American soil. That big bet worked because we had faith in a data-driven approach, even though we didn't know what the data would tell us the answer is, but we were determined to sort of be science-based in our approach. Another example is a story I write about at the end of the book. When I started at the Rockefeller Foundation, I was visiting New Orleans, and Mitch Landrieu was the dynamic, uh, super-connected mayor of New Orleans, who had worked for a few years to build a community collaboration around the removal of four Confederate statues, one of Robert E. Lee, but one that was also uh, an actual uh, statue to commemorate a white supremac supremacist terrorist attack on the integrated police force of New Orleans. And, and he and community leaders wanted to take these down. And the day before they were going to do that, the car bomb, a car bomb went off and, and exploded the car of the contractor that was to do the work. And the project stopped, it became hyper-political. They needed more money quickly to find contractors from outside of the state that could come in and, and do the work. Uh, and I had to make a judgment quickly with no data, really, about what the impact would be of helping Mitch remove these statues. Uh, so I made some phone calls, I went for a jog, I saw the statues the next morning. He had asked over dinner. And I determined you know, that we should go ahead and, and bet on Mitch. And I didn't have data, but I did know that he had done his homework, that, that he, it was not just Mitch, but a, a whole coalition of community leaders that had spent two or three years having a dialogue about doing this 
and they were going to do it the right way. Um, sure enough, we backed, we backed them. They took the statues down. It led to a national reckoning around the role of these Confederate statues in our racial dialogue uh, and ultimately became a national movement. But I had no way of knowing that at the time. And so that's a situation where really use gut, use instinct, and you use your assessment of your counterparty, uh, whom I was betting on, and, and their authenticity and, and the, you know, the community engagement that they had pursued to get there. And so that's much more judgment, much less data, but it's just as powerful at the end of the day. Raj Shah, optimist, uh, data nerd, and great storyteller. You currently serve as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Your new book is Big Bets, How Large-Scale Change Really Happens. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Scott. Appreciate you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.